Church at Station Hill, it is so good to be with you guys. Today, as we take a look at this fourth and final chapter in the book of Ruth, today we're asking the question is, how do we fit into this story of redemption that God has been telling since the beginning of time? And I was thinking this week specifically about Naomi's testimony, her story of redemption. Remember Naomi. Uh, she is the one that left the promised land in search of protection and provision outside of the promises of God. Remember Naomi, she lost her husband and her two sons. This is Naomi who said, the Lord has turned his hand against me. This is Naomi who said, don't know me by my name, know me by how I feel, and I feel bitter. But praise God that that is not the end of the story. I think if we got to hear Naomi's testimony today, it might sound a little bit more like, my God led me out of the deserts and he brought me into streams of living water. My God turned my bitter into sweet. Anybody have a testimony today of God turning your bitterness into sweetness, right? Your mourning into dancing? Then Psalm 107 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those that he has rescued and redeemed from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the son that he loves. That's what we're here to do today. So let's stand together. Let's sing. Let's learn this new song and let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing with me. He led me out of the desert, brought me into his streams, river of living water. He turned my bitter and sweet with all my burdens lifted. Took the shackles off my feet, and there's no sound louder than a captive set free. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of His promises evermore. Pour out Your thankfulness. Let it all flow. There is joy in the morning, springing up in my soul. There is life worth living, cause he calls me his own. And there's a hallelujah, after sweet victory. Oh, and there's no sound louder than a captive set free. Oh, there's no sound louder than a captive set free. a seat just for a second if you don't mind welcome to the church at station hill i continue to see folks every week that say i hadn't been here in a year 
right? And we are coming again, and it feels so good to be back among the believers, and we are thrilled to have you. We have a lot of other guests with us this morning because of baptisms, visiting friends. We've got all kinds of things. Good to see you guys. So a special word of welcome to you. If you are new to the life of our church, one of the easiest ways uh, to get plugged in or to learn a little bit more about us is just to grab our bulletin. Uh, That is available to you digitally. You can get it really easily. You can pull out your phone and text 623-623. Just text the word e-bulletin. And then every week you'll get a link, uh, a, a text with a link in it, and you can grab that. On that bulletin, you'll be able to connect with us. You'll be able to give. You'll be able to see all the things that are going on in the life of our church. So you might have noticed this weekend, you turned around and summer kind of slapped you in the face, didn't it? Just like, boom. Here I am, okay? So that means a lot of changes, a lot of different things in the life of our church. You'll hear more later on today uh, in, in today's service about VBS and, and all kinds of things. A lot of our life groups like to take a break, and so we, we move our attention toward summer connections groups and and meeting different people and doing different things over the summer. And then just a reminder also, today is the last Sunday that we'll actually have a 4 p.m. service for just a little while. We're going to put that on pause for the summer as well, Uh, regroup with that, and then launch that again uh, August the 1st, Uh, put a pause on that for just a little bit. So uh, if you know people that come to that or if sometimes you regularly come to that, you'll want to remember that as well. Today's a great day. Jay is going to be finishing up our time together in the book of Ruth, so be excited about that. And before we go any further, if you would, direct your attention to the baptistry. Hello, my name is Joshua William Bourne. I am 10 years old, and I have been a part of our church since before I was born, so I'm told. I have to admit, sometimes it's hard to understand what Pastor Jay is teaching and what the gospel really means, but I try my best to listen and learn. A few weeks ago, I told my mom and dad that I was ready to be baptized, and so here I am. I want to get baptized because I know Jesus died for me and it's not fair to waste that. I want to be covered by the blood of Jesus and have him guide me every single day for the rest of my life to help me have a better, fuller, and richer life. Jesus is my Lord and Savior and I think it's time to show everybody that I am a son of God in Jesus and that I believe in him and love him. Also, I want to get to heaven and live an eternal life and know that I will be there with Jesus and the people I love. Joshua? Is that your profession of faith? Yes. Well, with that, it's my honor and privilege to baptize you, my son, and now my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk again in a new life. (laughs) Amen, church, let's stand together. Let's continue to worship and continue to sing.
transformation of Joshua and his uh, transformation from darkness to light as well. May we remember what you brought us from and what you saved us from and who you've saved us to and that is to yourself and we thank you for the love you've shown us and for the love of Christ and it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, I'm Amy Keyes, the preschool minister. In three weeks from tomorrow, our building is going to be transformed into a dig site as we welcome hundreds of children through these doors um, to help them unearth the truth about Jesus through VBS Destination Dig. And we are so excited that we get to do VBS in person this year. Um, I'm 
so excited about these children who are going to walk through the doors and they're going to get to hear the gospel clearly presented to them. And I'm excited for the ones who are going to recognize their need for a savior and they're going to make the decision to become a Christian. But I'm also excited for those children who are going to walk through those doors and they're going to hear the gospel and the wheels are going to start turning in their heads and the Holy Spirit's going to be at work in their heart. We're not going to see it on the surface right away, but they're going to come back weeks later, maybe months later, for some, maybe even years later, and they're going to be ready to make a decision for Christ, and VBS is going to be part of their story. I was talking with Taylor Johnson, our children's minister this week, and he said that frequently when he talks with a child who's ready to make a decision for Christ, that they point back to VBS and how VBS was that time when they first recognized that they needed a savior. So you can start praying with us today for VBS and for all of those children who are gonna come through the doors and who are gonna hear the gospel. You can also help us by serving at VBS. We need lots of help and we need lots of faithful people who can help point these children to Christ. If you want to know more about the needs that we have, or maybe you're new to our church and you wanna know more about what VBS looks like at Station Hill, we've got a table out in the atrium with some people who would love to answer your questions and talk to you more about VBS. And there's another way that you can help too. Those children who come to VBS, who hear the gospel, and they get the wheels turning in their head, and the Holy Spirit starts to work in their heart, many of them are going to come back to church the Sunday after VBS, and the Sunday after that, and the Sunday after that, and they're going to come to Sunday morning groups, and they need us to be there to continue pointing them to Christ and continue to showing them the truth. So for those of you who already serve, thank you. For those of you who are going to serve, thank you. And thank you also for your faithfulness to give to our church. Because of your generous giving, we're able to put on programs like VBS, Destination Dig. We're so thankful for you and how you give. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that we can do VBS this year in person. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for those who have already signed up to come to serve. And Lord, I just pray that you will help us um, to faithfully share your truth with every boy and girl who walks through that door. Thank you that you are faithful to us. Um, and thank you that you died on the cross to save us. It's in your name I pray. Amen. In a time of loneliness... On the outside, looking in. Death was all that surrounded, and grief, my only friend. Then, you called my name with gentle words and patient love. What a breath of fresh air. This, this is redemption. Good morning, church family. Hope you're doing well today. If you will, take your Bibles and turn with me to the fourth chapter of the book of Ruth. Uh, as we finish part four of a four-part series, uh, looking at each chapter of Ruth before we uh, move on next week to another topic. Uh, but uh, it has been a joy to teach through this story, and I appreciate your emails and your encouragement and the things that the, the Lord has shown you uh, throughout this. Uh, it's been a big weekend for our family. Uh, my second daughter, Lexi, uh, graduated high school yesterday, and so there's a picture of Lexi. Uh, and so she is headed to Union University along with her sister in the fall, and so we're proud of her. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, I need to share with you is that I'm also a little sad, um, not only because, right, we won't see Lexi all of the time when she moves off to college, but because Lexi has probably been the source of a good 30 to 40 percent of my sermon illustrations. <laughs> right? Over the years. I mean, she really has. She's that kid that God gave us who is full of personality and humor. Uh, and so yesterday at her graduation, her mom and I had the opportunity to get up and say a few words of blessing over her. Uh, and one of the things that her mom presented to her by surprise was a journal that she's been keeping since she was a baby full of Lexi stories. And so last night, 
I had to go find that journal, right? Because that's the source of some good material for me. Uh, And so sure enough, flipping through it, I found the story that I had forgotten about. And so here's a picture of little Lexi, right? When she was about two, three years old. Uh, And so you can just see the mischief behind those eyes, can't you? And so uh, it was Christmas. She had gotten a ring pop in her stocking and she hadn't eaten all of it on Christmas day. So she woke up the day after Christmas and she found that ring pop early in the morning. So she approached my mother-in-law, her grandmother, who was with us for the holidays, first thing in the morning, you know, kids know which one to find, right? Found grandma and said, I want to eat this for breakfast. Grandmas did what grandmas do, right? Go talk to your dad. So, because grandparents don't like to say no uh, to anything. And so she approaches me, I'm in the kitchen, I'm working on breakfast, and she asks, get this, here's the question she asks me. Dad, is this my ring pop? Well, yes, it is, Lexi. She marches back in to grandmother. Dad said yes. (laughs) Clever, right? So here's what my my wife wrote at, at the end of that story in her journal. Two years old and two months. It starts so young, right? Because it's true. Our desire, right, to manipulate, to take control, to put things into our own hands, to make the story play out the way we want it to, that starts in us very, very young. And as we've been walking through the book of Ruth, we have seen what we call the ordinary providence of God how God's sovereignty is at work, how his hand is the one moving along the story. The characters in the book, where they get into trouble is when they try to step outside of God's plan, as Luke shared earlier. But when they're obedient and respond to him by faith, well, then they step into the plans that God has ordained for them all along. And so today we're going to pick up the story. We know at this moment, Ruth and Naomi are waiting. They've positioned themselves for God to work through Boaz, but they're going to have to wait the outcome of another man who could be the Redeemer. Will you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read the first 12 verses of chapter 4 of the book of Ruth this morning. Boaz went to the gate of the town and sat down there. Soon the family Redeemer Boaz had spoken about came by. Boaz said, come over here and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Then Boaz took 10 men of the town's elders and said, sit here, and they sat down. He said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has returned from the territory of Moab, is selling the portion of the field that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should inform you. Buy it back in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you do want to redeem it, do it. But if you do not want to redeem it, tell me so that I will know. Because there isn't anyone other than you to redeem it, and I am next after you. Well, I want to redeem it, he answered. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from Naomi, you will acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the deceased man, to perpetuate the man's name on his property. The Redeemer replied, Well, I can redeem it myself, for I will ruin my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption, because I can't redeem it. Now, at an earlier period in Israel, a man removed his sandal and gave it to the other party in order to make any matter legally binding concerning the right of redemption or the exchange of property. This was the method of legally binding a transaction in Israel. So the Redeemer removed his sandal and said to Boaz, buy back the property yourself. Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I am buying from Naomi everything that belonged to Elimelech. Kilian and Malon. I've also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife to perpetuate the deceased man's name on his property so that his name will not disappear among his relatives or from the gate of his hometown. You are witnesses today. All of the people who were at the city gate, including the elders, said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is entering your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. May you be powerful in Epaphra, and may your name be known in Bethlehem. May your house become like the house of Perez, the son Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Oh, Lord Jesus, you are in the details of our life. We can't always see it. We don't always recognize it but we can look back and believe it. 
So would we trust you and walk by faith today? Would each of us have the courage to take the next step into your grace, into your redemption, and recognize that you are at work in ways far beyond what we could ever dare to dream or hope or imagine? We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this story that points us to your story. And it's in your name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So as we have been working our way through Ruth, as I've shared with you, one of the things that's so compelling to me is that the book of Ruth, really chapter by chapter, leads us to ask some of the biggest questions that we have in life. Chapter number one, Naomi loses her husband, her two sons died, she is left in grief, and it begs the question, right, is God there when I hurt? Where is God in my grief and in my pain? Week two, we see Ruth and Naomi arriving in Bethlehem and Ruth steps out to gather grain to simply be able to make a meal for she and Naomi. And the author tells us that she happened to step into the field belonging to Boaz, a relative, a member of their clan who could do something about their situation. And that leads us to ask the question, right, is God in the details of our life? And the narrator is giving us these hints all along the way. Last week, chapter three, the question, right? If we really believe that God is sovereign, that he's at work, well, then what's our role and responsibility? And we saw Naomi coaching Ruth and how to position herself to basically propose to Boaz, asking that he become her kinsman redeemer. And this week, the big question, of course, is how does my story fit into God's great big story? What is God up to in the details of all of our lives? Now, to be clear, our story is not Ruth's story. Every story is unique, but God works his wonders faithfully, consistently throughout our lives when we respond to him. And so what we're going to see in chapter four today is the story of four redeemers, four redeemers. Redeemer number one, and this is our first point this morning, is this. There is a price that must be paid. There is a price that has to be paid. So last week we left you on the cliffhanger and Ruth had approached Boaz had basically asked him, right, to to become her protector, to become her redeemer, uh, and to, to basically become her husband. And so Boaz had agreed. However, Boaz, being a man of integrity, said there is actually a clan member who is closer than me in relation to you. And so he has the first right of refusal. But he says, I will resolve it immediately this day, Naomi notes. And so he sets out to redeem the situation. And so in verse one, Boaz goes to the gate of the town and sat down there. Now in ancient times, the way that cities were constructed was that they were there for safety. And so generally your dwelling place, your house would be within the walls of the city. So you couldn't be robbed or attacked by yourself at night. And then you would go out through the city gate during the day to your fields to be able to work. And so over time, the city gate kind of became the part of town that everybody passed through. Over time, the elders, the older men of the community, they would set up shop there as well. They would sit there, and if there was official business that needed to be transacted, kind of like we have notary publics today, well, they were there to conduct that business, to be witnesses. It was also the place, I'm pretty sure, where they sat around and drank their coffee. I was trying to think about the modern-day equivalent of what this would have been like, the city gate, and it's probably Hardee's, right? That's what old guys do in our culture today. Maybe Cracker Barrel. Uh, That's one of my favorite places to go early in the morning for meetings, and I'll often see the mayor, or I'll see the chief of police, or the head of our fire department, right? And that's where they sit and gather, and they have casual conversation, they they swap their stories, but sometimes there's business to be done. And you can bet that as much business gets done in a Hardee's or Cracker Barrel than at City Hall. It's where the real meeting takes place. And so the city gate was that kind of place. And in this moment, again, the text gives us this idea, this hint that God is up to something in this moment. It says, soon or behold, the family redeemer Boaz had spoken about came by. It's the same word that we see in chapter two for Ruth happened to step in the field belonging to Boaz. It just so happened that this man passed by. And what's really interesting to me is there's a phrase that we totally lose in the English. Boaz says, come over here. Some of your translations will add my friend. What that is in Hebrew is a play on words. It sounds like this, Poloni Almoni. Here's the English equivalent, Joe Schmo. And so this Joe Schmo passes by. Mr. So-and-so, he doesn't even get a name. 
Why? We're going to find out why he's not even named because he's not going to be remembered because of his lack of action in just a few moments. But Boaz, being above board, right, has him come and sit down. He calls the 10 elders of the town around him. That's accountability. Again, Boaz, being an upstanding man, wants to make sure there's witnesses. And he says to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has returned from Moab, is selling the portion of the field that belonged to our brother Elimelech. And all of a sudden, we get a bit of information we didn't have. Elimelech still apparently had not sold all of his property when he left for Moab. And that's probably another reason that Naomi returned is because that was the only inheritance that they had. That was the only thing that she had left. But as I mentioned last week, the harvest is coming to an end. They've already threshed out the grain. So at this point, for she and Ruth to be able to survive, they weren't going to be able to go out and glean and gather grain to make food any longer. So there's an urgency. The only way that they could survive would be to sell the land. And in the ancient world, especially in Israel, selling the land was an absolute last resort because it was your tie to God's promises. It was your tie to your family line. It was your tie to your community. Selling land is a big deal now. Anybody try to find a house around here lately? You know how difficult it is. You know how hot real estate is. Well, in that era, it not only was it just a place for your family to dwell, but it was your legacy. It was your future as well. And it's why in the Old Testament there were so many laws about how land had to be passed down. And so she's in this desperate situation And again, Boaz, being an upstanding man, wants to set the record clear. He says, I thought I should inform you. You have the chance to buy it back in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you want to redeem it, we'll go ahead and do it. And he knows, right, that Naomi and Ruth are attached to this land. And so he knows that they will be provided for. But if you do not want to redeem it, tell me so that I will know. Because there isn't anybody else other than you to redeem it. And I am next in line. And so in this moment, the guy thinks to himself, okay, a piece of property, a widow, she can't eat that much. She can't be that much of a burden to me. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to redeem that land. It makes sense. Immediately he responds in the text, I want to redeem it. That word redeem simply means pay the price. I'm willing to pay the price for it. It will increase my land holding. It will increase my stature in the community. It'll increase my stature within the clan because I have taken care of this widow. It's a business deal that makes sense. But Boaz is holding an ace in his hand, isn't he? There's another part of the story. Then Boaz says, on the day you buy the field from Naomi, you will acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the deceased man, to perpetuate the man's name on his property. Whoa, stop the presses. Now this guy begins to do new calculations in his mind. You can almost watch the wheels turn. Okay, it's one thing to have to provide for a widow, but now another mouth to feed. Oh, and not only that, right? If she becomes part of the family, this isn't just a business decision. This is a family decision as well. And if she has more children, do you know what that means? That's even more mouths to feed. Anybody got a bunch of kids like I do? Have you you seen groceries, the price of groceries these days? We can all relate. More and more of our money goes to just feeding our kids. Same thing in that era. And so he begins to do the mental math on this, what would this cost? And then he begins to think about the future. He talks about his inheritance. Well, if she has children, then I've got to now split up the land between even more children. And so all of a sudden he backpedals really, really quickly. And he says, I can't redeem it myself or I will ruin my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption because I can't do it. It's a hard no for me. Anybody remember American Idol? Not going to do it, right? No dog, not going to happen. Not feeling it. And so at this moment, The first redeemer looks at the price that must be paid, the sacrifice to take care of this widow and redeem the land. And he says, I can't do it. The price is too high. And this leads us to the second redeemer, of course, who is Boaz. He's already told us he's the next guy in line. He is willing to pay the price and fulfill his promise. And we don't hear this in the text, but I can only imagine, right, in my mind, at that moment when the guy says, I can't do it, inside, Boaz is like, yes. Now the way is paved. His conscience is clear. All things have been upstanding and above board. And now Boaz has the opportunity to be able to redeem Ruth. 
What's interesting is, as we get this little bit of a, a legal disclaimer in verse 7, which is kind of funny to me, at an earlier period in Israel, usually when we talk about the Bible, we talk about like back in the old days. Well, this is even back in the old days for the Bible, right? Back in the old days, back in the old days. And you get this little disclaimer, a man removed his sandal and gave it to the other party in order to make any matter of legally binding concerning the right of redemption and the change of property. It's like that little legalese they put at the end of all of those commercials about pills and things on television. That's what we get to make it clear that this was a sealed deal. Apparently, this tradition came from the time in the book of Joshua, when you would walk the land to prove that it was yours. And so that idea about feet, right? And if you conquer somebody, you put them under your feet. That's where this tradition came from at the moment. But if you think about it, it's a pretty weird tradition. Because back in those days, they walked everywhere. Their feet got sweaty. There was camel dung, right? And so to take off that nasty sandal and give it to somebody as your sign is pretty gross. So we can understand why even then, that tradition didn't last, because it was just strange. But the author wants us to know that Boaz did absolutely everything he was supposed to do. It was, there were witnesses, there was the official sandal swap that took place. All of these things point to the fact that Boaz was a man of his word. And then what's fascinating is we get in verse 11, this blessing it kind of comes out of the blue, right? This is just kind of a typical land redemption thing going on there at the city gates. But all of a sudden in verse 11, we get clued into the fact that this story is going to zoom out and get bigger and bigger. All, all of the people who are at the city gate, including the elders said, we are witnesses. And then we get a triple blessing. May the Lord first make the woman who is entering your house like Rachel and Leah. And what did they do? Together built the house of Israel. If you remember, Rachel and Leah, right? They gave birth to the 12 sons who would become what? The 12 tribes of Israel. And so what a tremendous blessing that they recognize the faithfulness and the loyalty of this outsider that they are asking that a Moabite, a woman who is from a clan that is their enemies, that God would weave her into their plan so that she would be a matriarch of their people. That's a tremendous blessing. Blessing number two is for Boaz. May you be powerful, a word that means worthy. May you live worthy in our community and your name be well known in Bethlehem. In other words, Boaz, may you have the strength to continue to be the man of noble character and high standing and reputation that you are. And then number three is most interesting of all. May your house become like the house of Perez. This is a blessing for the family. The son Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. Now, Tamar, that is a messy story if you want to go back and read it in Genesis 38. The short translation of it is this. What the people of the community are saying is that if God could bless that, then imagine what he can do with this marriage. If God can take a mess, right, a mess that we've created of things and continue to move his storyline and his people forward, well, then imagine what God can do with an upright and noble man, with an outstanding woman of faith. Imagine what God can do in their marriage. And ultimately, Boaz pays the price. He keeps his word. He fulfills his promise. And men, I need your eyes and ears for a moment, young men as well, because I'm going to tell you right now, we need more men like Boaz in our church. We need more men like Boaz in our culture. It's imperative in this day and age that as men, we see a need and we respond to that need. I've told you before, Boaz was not the brother of Kilian and Malon. Translation, he was not obligated by law to become the redeemer, but he saw a need. He saw a widow in distress and he provided for that need. He didn't have to choose to get involved, but he did. And we need more men who will do what Boaz did, who will be men of God's word, who will seek to apply that word in the way that they pray, in the way they provide, in the way that they protect. Dads and grandparents, we need to raise up a generation of young men to make a difference in our homes, in our communities, in our churches, and ultimately in our world. Boaz is a model of what we should be. Why? Because ultimately Boaz points us to the character of Christ himself. 
And so as men go, so go our culture. And the reality for us is, is that the, the institution of manhood and being a biblical man has been under attack for a long time by the forces of this world. And it's time for us to stand up and recognize character when we see it. And a good place to start is by following the example of Boaz, who chose to do what was right, who chose to get involved when he didn't have to. And he made a difference, as we're going to see, not only in his family, but in generations to come. And this leads us, of course, to a third redeemer. A baby is born in Bethlehem. I hope you are beginning to pick up on the gospel hints that are all over this story. But a baby is born in Bethlehem. So there is a wedding. I don't know again how this story took place, but can you imagine Boaz shows back up after the meeting at the city gate behind his back? He doesn't have a bouquet of flowers, but instead he has a smelly sandal and he presents it to Ruth. And the symbol is what? I am your redeemer. I have bought back the land. I have paid the price and the wedding can happen. And so they are married and that marriage produces a son. That union produces a son. And now all of the story, it's sudden the story begins to pick up pace. Think about Ruth's journey with me for a moment. When we open the book, she was a foreign widow of a people who were enemies of God. By faith, she became one of the family of God, and then she became a servant in that land. She became a maidservant, as she described herself in chapter 3. Then she became a daughter. Boaz called her a daughter twice, and now she has become a wife. What an incredible transformation, and it shows how God can work in the story of someone who is simply faithful and willing to take the next step. God makes all things new. And if we think about the love story of Ruth and Boaz, as I've said before, we've all watched a lot of TV shows and a lot of movies. And so we want to see a dramatic wedding and instead we got a lot of legal detail. Why? That was to show and to demonstrate that Boaz was willing to do what it was required to pay the price. But there are themes here that we can all relate to. Two unlikely people get together against all odds. But the emphasis is not on their smoking hot good looks or their burning passion and desire for each other. Instead, the emphasis is on their faith and on their character, which is exactly where it should be. And listen, this is not some Ruth just had a great personality, right? Ruth was a really good guy. That's not what the Bible's saying. What the Bible is saying is that it all works together. And when God brings together a man and a woman in a marriage, in a union, Two become one, as it says in the book of Genesis. They become a team for what God wants to do in their life together to advance his plan and purposes. I remind couples of this in premarital counseling all of the time. What you're doing when you get married is not merely signing a contract, right? You do your thing, I'll do mine, right? We'll bring that to the marriage. If it's all good, we're good. And if not, then we'll split apart. That's not what the Bible's talking about when it talks about marriage. It's a covenant, It's a recognizing that the Holy Spirit has brought together two individuals for his plan and his purpose. Next Saturday, my parents who are here today, Greg and Paula Strother, will celebrate 50 years of marriage. And so I praise God for them, and I'm going to take a moment of pastoral privilege and say congratulations, mom and dad. We were sitting around with some friends at dinner last night after Lexi's graduation telling the story of how they met. My mom was a nursing student, all girls. My dad was at engineering school, pretty much all guys. The church my mom went to hosted a banquet where they happened to invite all these engineering students, right, uh, to join them, and they met. And so you hear those stories of how God works in the details of people's lives to bring them together. And then he establishes a family that establishes a legacy God works through his plan in the lives and the hearts of his people. And so one of the themes that's been throughout this book is that this family line has been at risk. And God provided. He first provided food for Naomi and Ruth. He provided protection for them. And now he provides a future as well. A baby boy is born. And this boy is going to play a role in redemptive history. If you think about it, God often intervenes to bring forth children in his story. You have Abraham and Sarah who eventually give birth to Isaac. 
Rebecca gives birth to Jacob and Esau, Leah and Rachel. They have the 12 sons we've already talked about. Hannah gives birth to Samuel the prophet. All throughout the biblical storyline is keep your eye on the kid because God is up to something here. And church family, that's why we fight for the sanctity of human life. That's why in a culture of death, we are praying that God will reverse the laws of this land and we will see more children live because every child is created in the image of God with a plan and a purpose. Every child is a link of God's promises from one generation to the next. And so if you are paying attention to the news this week, join me in praying. The Supreme Court has decided to take up a landmark case in that battle in June. And so pray that God's will will be done. Pray that we will see the laws of this land change so that children will live. Because children are an important link in God's plan, created in his image, not an accident, not a mistake, but a part of what God has done and a part of what God is going to do. And so at this moment in the story, we see Naomi transformed. She was hopeless, now she's full of hope. She said she's empty and what does she say now? Her arms are full of life because she's holding a baby boy, her grandson. You ever held a, a squiggly, right, squirmy little boy? You know what it's like to hold life if you've held a boy who is full of life. All you grandparents out there, you love showing me the pictures of those grandkids. You love showing me the stories. A lot of you figured out how to use social media, right, so that you could brag about how cute your grandkids are. Ken Parker, who preached here several years ago, he said something I'll never forget from this platform. Ken said, grandkids are God's reward for letting your children live, right? <laughs> I've never forgot it, Ken, thank you for that. And one of these days, right, when the time's right, we're looking forward uh, to that stage of life. But the reality is, is this, this child brought joy to Naomi. As a matter of fact, the Bible says they had a special relationship. She, she raised him, right, as her own. And so we see God's plan at work, and we also see something highly unusual. This is the only time in the Old Testament when a parent did not give a child a name. Did you catch that? Instead, the community gives the child the name. It says in verse 17, the neighbor women said, a son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. That means servant. Obadiah the prophet, that's a variation of it, servant of Yahweh. But the name Obed means a servant. And here is the exclamation point as the, the lens zooms out even more. By the way, he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Wait, say what? That's what the story is about to the original audience? This is the family line of David. Yeah, that David, the one who beat Goliath. Yeah, that David, King David, who established the monarchy, who conquered Jerusalem. The David, right, who God promised, and one of his heirs would always be on the throne, ultimately leading to the Messiah. That David, yes, this is his backstory. And the story doesn't end there. That's why there is a fourth redeemer in this passage. You see, Ruth doesn't end with a baby, but with a family tree. And so when we get to these last verses and we see a genealogy, let's just be honest. Most of us, when we're skimming through the Bible, we're like, oh, another genealogy, right? A list of names that are hard to pronounce. When I was in Alabama, the preacher that I was under there would just say, Bubba, son of Bubba, son of Bubba, right? <laughs> this is the easiest way to not have to deal with all those Hebrew names. But here's the thing. To the Jewish people, these genealogies were crucial because they were the living link from God's promises. They were the living link from one generation to the next to see all that God had done. And right here in this passage, right, there are 10 names listed. There's actually more names in the genealogy if you look in First Chronicles, but that was the way that royal genealogies were presented. Lists of 10 at a time. And so when you begin to realize what's happening here, you begin to be in awe of God's plan because you realize that God took a Moabitess widow, married a Jewish farmer, and together they formed the royal line that would bring the king. Not only that, the story doesn't end there. And so one of the things that I want you to be clear on today is what I wanna call the gospel according to Ruth. Because you see, this is one of the greatest stories ever written down in history. It really is. 
It's better than any TV show or movie I've ever seen when you dive deep into the details of the story of Ruth. It's incredible. But, but even this story isn't complete without pointing to the greatest story ever told. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1 because the story doesn't even end here. It links, it bridges us to the New Testament. Matthew, who was a Jewish man writing to a primarily Jewish audience, linking the old covenant and the new, says this in Matthew 1.1, the account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's going to give us this genealogy. Why? Because verse 21, she, Mary, will give birth to a son and will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That word save can be translated redeem. The book of Ruth, our series title, Redemption, what God does to pay the price. And here in the genealogy, if you look down in verse uh, five, you'll see Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Wait, stop the presses. Who is Boaz's mother? Rahab? Wait, you mean the prostitute from Jericho who saved the Israelite spies? Wait, wasn't she too an outsider, an enemy of God's people who by faith got in? And all of a sudden it clicks. Why would Boaz take interest in Ruth, an enemy of God's people who was an outsider? Well, his mom had been an enemy of God's people and an outsider who got in by faith. You see, God doesn't miss a detail. And Boaz had a heart for this woman because he saw his own mother in her story and in her journey. You see, that's another way that Boaz is like Christ. He sees people who are far off, who need to become part of the family, who need to come under the protection of the great Redeemer. And so Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. There she is. Obed fathered Jesse and Jesse fathered King David. And you can follow the genealogy on because it goes all the way to Jesus Christ, the one who will redeem his people from their sins. And so to sum it up, I want to put this on the screen for you this morning. I want you to realize just how deep and how good God's promises are. The gospel according to Ruth, God, yes, provided a son for Ruth. And that in and of itself is a great story. But not only that, he provided a redeemer for Naomi. So that her family name, the family name of Elimelech, her husband, would live on so that she would have joy in her old age, knowing that God had been faithful to her. Not only that, God provided a king for Israel from this family line. These people, outsiders, get woven in into one of the great families of Israel. And last but certainly not least, God provided a savior for the whole world. It's breathtaking. And it all started with what? A step of faith taking the step of faith and trusting God for the results. So as we come to the end of the story, as I said earlier, Ruth's story isn't our story, but it's a story that's there to remind us that God in the details of our story is writing his larger story. He's faithful from generation to generation, but it starts with a single step. What is the step of faith God is leading you to take today? Bow your heads with me as we come to this time of response. I love this story because it shows that God had a plan all along. That even when things were dark, even when things were difficult, that God was on the move. And it's why it's consistent with the gospel that God created a perfect world, but we broke it and it's broken by sin. And the Bible doesn't shy away from that. It's clear that we are in the darkness, just as Ruth was written in the period of Judges, one of the darkest periods in Israel's history. So we sense that we are in a time that's dark and growing darker. Yet we read, we remember that God made a way for Ruth and Naomi to be redeemed, for the price to be paid, that they would have a hope and a future. We read of a man named Boaz, who is willing to pay the price. And it reminds us, it points us directly to Jesus, who on the cross paid the price so that we could come out of the darkness and into the light, so that we could have a future and a hope. And so today, whatever step of faith that you need to take, would you have the faith to take it? Recognizing that God is in the smallest details, and at the same time, he is in the biggest story. He does the heavy lifting. 
He is the one who's the ultimate hero of the story. But He gives us the opportunity to respond in faith to His grace, to His mercy, to His redeeming power. And so in this moment, I want to give you a moment before I close this in prayer as we wrap up this series to ask God, what is that step that you need to take today? For some of you, it's the step from death to life, from being full of yourself to being full of Christ and his goodness. For some of you, you know the story. You've made the step of faith, but you've forgotten how God works in the details. And whatever God is putting before you now, would you have the courage to take that step today? Let me give you a moment to pray, and then I'm going to close us together. Jesus, we're in awe of your story. That the book of Ruth shows us that you are in our smallest steps. And yet at the same time, that you, you are the hero of the story of redemption that you've been writing since the dawn of time. And so Lord, in this moment, would you find us faithful to respond to your word in obedience? just as you are always faithful to us. We thank you for the good news that Ruth points us to. The good news is, is there was a baby boy born in Bethlehem who came to redeem his people from their sin. That's us. And so we get into the story as outsiders by faith. That faith is what saves us. And your grace is available to all. So help us to respond today in spirit and in truth. And it's in your name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. Stand with us as we sing these words in response. Riches, sing it with me. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. mercy, his grace, his passion, his redemption, his more. And so today, if you need to respond in any way, that's why we're here. Myself, our team will be by the Next Steps banner just to your left as you exit. It would be our greatest joy and privilege to point you to the God who redeems. If you're at home watching online, you can simply text the word CONNECT to 623-623, and one of our team members will follow up with you as soon as possible. But today we go to live out this good news that we have a redeemer and redemption is available for all who would come by faith. And so let's go to share that good news, knowing these two things, that you are loved and you are sent. Let's sing the doxology as we close. Sing with me. Praise God from whom all blessings. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy 
grace and peace to love and serve the Lord. You're dismissed.